So let us begin by discussing the diagnosis and disease burden for patients who face polycythemia vera. Polycythemia vera is one of the core Philadelphia chromosome negative myeloproliferative neoplasms. This is a disease that I would say is neither common nor it is rare. The disease characterized by a clonal proliferation of uh, hematopoietic stem cells, uh, in particular affecting the red cells, the leukocytes, and the platelets, in particular of myeloid origin. The MPNs in general also include patients with essential thrombocythemia, as well as myelofibrosis, both primary as well as individuals that have myelofibrosis that evolved from polycythemia vera or essential thrombocythemia. Polycythemia vera can lead to clearly erythrocytosis that can be manifest as an increase in the red cell mass, as well as risk of thrombosis, hemorrhage, and the potential of a decreased life expectancy. The prevalence of polycythemia vera is approximately 44 to 57 patients per 100,000 individuals with a slight predominance of men over women, although that is fairly uh, mild. In general, that leads to a prevalence that's approximately 150,000 patients in the United States that have polycythemia vera at any given time. It's a disease that is associated with aging overall, with a median age of diagnosis approximately in the early 60s. However, it's notable that there clearly are many younger patients with the disease, with a full 20 to 25% of patients being less than age 40. Polycythemia vera is a disease associated with genetic mutations, in particular, the mutations in the JAK2 gene. The Janus kinase 2 gene mutation was identified in 2005, and the very specific V617F mutation is present in about 90 to 95% of patients with polycythemia vera. About 1 to 3% of patients uh, might have the JAK2 exon 12 mutation. And additionally, by complete sequencing, we are now finding some other rare uh, variants of the JAK2 mutation. Individuals clearly can have mutations in other somatic genes as well. Most specifically, they do not have mutations in either calreticulin or MPL. These are mutations which we find more specifically with myelofibrosis or essential thrombocythemia but they can have other mutations such as mutations in TET2, ASX01. Not all patients with polycythemia vera do have a mutation, but it is a very small minority that do not. Patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms can be quite symptomatic, with patients with polycythemia vera clearly being amongst the most symptomatic in that group. These symptoms can range from difficulties with fatigue, pruritus, difficulties with night sweats, uh, and as the disease progresses more toward myelofibrosis, they can have difficulties such as fever and unanticipated weight loss. Amongst patients with MPNs, pruritus is the most uh, severe in those with polycythemia vera. Now, when should you suspect polycythemia vera? Typically, it's seen in individuals that are being cared for in primary care who have unexplained erythrocytosis, thrombocytosis, and or leukocytosis. It's notable that if they have iron deficiency, they may not have overt erythrocytosis to begin with. Another group we need to consider are those with unexplained thrombosis, in particular, in certain vascular distributions. So a P. vera patient can have a thrombotic event in any vascular distribution, but in particular, those that have a portal vein thrombosis, a sagittal vein thrombosis, uh, have a higher likelihood of having polycythemia vera or a myeloproliferative neoplasm. If patients have pruritus, which is a common feature, we should be even more mindful in the setting of thrombosis. Now, to quantify these symptoms, our group has helped to develop and validate the MPN-SAF total symptom score. These are 10 items from 0 to 10 that can help to quantify the significant symptom burden these patients face and track it over time as we treat these patients. Now, how do we diagnose these patients? In 2016, there was a revision of the World Health Organization criteria for diagnosing polycythemia vera. It involves 
first, the major criteria with a hemoglobin of over 16 and a half grams per deciliter in men or over 16 in women. Or as well, there's a parallel hematocrit criteria or for increased red cell mass. Second, bone marrow biopsy changes, including hypercellularity, increased erythrocytosis, and no evidence of an alternative myeloid neoplasm. Third, the presence of the JAK2 V617F or the JAK2 exon 12 mutation. As minor criteria is a subnormal serum erythropoietin level. That minor criteria is in particular helpful if individuals do not have the presence of the JAK2 mutation. They have erythrocytosis, changes uh, on the bone marrow, as well as a subnormal EPO, that can be sufficient for diagnosis. Now the disease burden of this disease can include risk of vascular events, it can include risk of cytopenias, particularly in the setting of progressive disease or from medical therapy. There's a risk of progression to either myelofibrosis or to acute leukemia. There can be the burden of splenomegaly. There can be the symptoms which I've just discussed, and we need to be mindful how this disease can aggravate underlying comorbidities. The survival of patients with polycythemia vera is uh, slightly less than that of age match controls. And for many individuals, if they do not have progressive disease, will uh, live their normal lifespan. The known causes of death in those individuals who we do attribute to passing away from polycythemia vera include risk of acute leukemia, thrombotic complications, non-leukemic progression, heart failure, or risk of secondary malignancies. I would summarize by saying that polycythemia vera is one of the three myeloproliferative neoplasms that affects about 150,000 patients in the United States. Most cases do have a detectable change in the JAK2 gene, although other genes have been found. The diagnosis involves major and or minor criteria and the presence of proliferative abnormalities as well as the JAK2 mutations. These patients can experience a range of potentially debilitating symptoms, a shortened lifespan, uh, in particular due to their increased risk of thrombosis and bleeding. 